What's up, everybody? Welcome once again to the trenches on Sherdog.com on the YouTube page. Um, this is our weekly live chat for all of you who are uninformed. Uh, time to time to tune in. Time to get those questions ready because we have a lot to talk about, and there is no one better to talk about these things with than uh, an incredible man, uh, a, a great individual, a model citizen, uh, perhaps. Uh, the finest human being that steps foot on this earth as we speak. He is Captain Credential. He is also known as the CEO Collector, Mr. Jason Burgos. Jason, how are you feeling today? I got you. No, like, <laughs> did we mess up again? All right. <laughs> I am great. I've got my uh, not Moscow Mule J. It is a ginger ale with ice. Very classy. Uh, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Why so close though? All I got was knuckle. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Just because, yeah, because I, I was just right there on this. It's just thumbs down for that. But I am good. Ready to talk a whole bunch of uh, what's going on in the world of MMA as you captain the ship through the waters, the rough waters of MMA. Fascinating stuff this week. And I'm just curious to answer some questions because I mean we've got comedians in the forum. I know Europe one. I'm looking at you. God works in mysterious ways, Europe One. I hope you know that. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, Europe One, there's some Kung Fu bows that might get snatched off the plate. <laughs> Keep talking that shit. <laughs> but yeah, man, it's it's a whole lot to talk about. Like this was um a very interesting week of news and for actual fights, actual yeah. events. So yeah. we have a lot to talk about. And um, since we did start late. Let's go ahead and get right to it so we don't waste any more of our lovely viewers' time. So this is from the sh the Schmoop. I, I guess how you pronounce it. <laughs> Man, the, these names, bro. The these names. Wait, number one is from the Schmoop? I thought it was from Drunk and Vava Chancha. Because uh, we're, we're going in different order because we're going to talk about the, the breaking news first. Um, <laughs> I see yeah, the Schmoop. I the Schmoop. Uh, that's what's up. All right. So uh, are we going to claim TJ <laughs> is still champ since he didn't lose his belt? That's what we do here, right? <laughs> why Why would we claim that he's the champ? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing he's talking more about uh, some of uh, what we talk about in MMA as far as um, people being stripped like John Jones and Daniel Cormier and uh, Conor McGregor uh, stri being stripped of his belts and champions emerging after that. Uh, it, it, because there is definitely a clear path of all these these belts, lineal belts being broken. So uh, I guess that's what he's referring to. But but Jason, what's your take on this? Uh, no, he's you know yeah he's not. Well, I'm not going to refer to him as the champion. I mean, he lost it. He he's been, he's been you know relinquished it and just been stripped of it. And, I mean, honestly, by the New York State Athletic Commission. I mean, it's a tough situation. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be weird. I'm curious to see how. Fans react to him when he comes back, how the UFC reacts to him when he comes back. I wonder if he ever makes any kind of statements on it because, I mean, we all feel, and I think I've seen a lot of people say this. Of course, you got the peanut gallery with the steroids and all kind of jumping on him like people love to do on social media. But I'm curious if it ends up being something like he was taking a diuretic because he was taking so much crap to make that weight cut. You know, will people look at this a little differently than other, you know, positive tests? You know, because it was him trying to do abnormal things to make a fight and it boy it sure has become a disaster situation for that man yeah big big time disaster man as far as referring to him as the champ like no he's yeah. not i mean the belt is no longer sitting on his on his waist so he's not the champion and i know when he comes back in action or when a new champion is crowned there will be those same people that are that are going to um doubt that championship reign but I like to go by what is actually recognized by uh, whatever governing bodies there are, by the promotion, uh, by what's actually going on in the present. And in the present, TJ Dillashaw is not the champion. Um, whether he deserves to be stripped of that or should have dropped the belt voluntarily, whatever the case may be, it is not us for not up uh, to us to decide right now. That, that's not our job here right now because we really don't know enough about this situation to make any declarative statements one way or the other. But we do know for sure he's no longer the UFC Bantamweight champion. And, and I think that's just it's pretty much that simple. Um, so let's go to uh, this week's poll question. 
And uh, this poll question, obviously, um, is is drawn a, a fair amount of uh, controversy all over MMA um, uh, message boards and articles and whatnot uh, on, across multiple outlets. So uh, with TJ Dillashaw vacating his belt, who should face Marlon Marias for the vacant Bantamweight title? Uh, we have 63% in favor of Henry Cejudo. We have 28% in favor of Pedro Munoz. We have 4% in favor of Aljamain Sterling. And other is at 5%. I don't know who those other could be. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there, that's, maybe maybe I, I could see someone mentioning Cody Garbrandt because he lost his title to Dillashaw. But other than that, I don't, I don't know who other yeah. could be. Um, but... but um, I'm um, I'm not too surprised. Oh, oh, uh, Jay just dropped the the notes. The other um, includes Dominic Cruz and John Lineker, so that makes sense. But uh, Dominic Cruz is perpetually injured. Um, Peter Yan also uh, is is someone that that's being mentioned. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, I, I do. I think the top three answers make all the sense in the world. Um, Henry Cejudo, for obvious reasons. I mean, he just knocked out T.J. Dillashaw just what a month and a half ago, two months ago, something like that. Uh, so it makes sense that the last guy to beat the Bantamweight champion or former Bantamweight champion at this point would be fighting for uh, the the actual Bantamweight title at this point. And then we know that that was a fight that uh, seemed like the UFC was trying to put together before, that they were trying to until this um, adverse finding in his, his uh, PED test, they were trying to rematch them for the Bantamweight title, uh, according to everything we were hearing. So... Yeah, I get why people are in favor of that. Pedro Munoz makes a lot of sense because he did just knock out Cody Garbrandt on, on a very big card at UFC 235, and it was a, a very dramatic fight as well. Very very much the crowd pleaser, and he kind of emerged out of nowhere. Aljamain Sterling just had a, an impressive performance against Jamie Rivera, who's also one of those guys that, that kind of is hovering around that title picture. Uh, so it makes sense. To, to talk about Aljamain Sterling in this conversation as well. Um, but some of those others, I, I mean, Dominic Cruz, like, man, the guy the guy is on the shelf. He's on the shelf. Like, he, he doesn't exist uh, a, as far as the fights go right now. Uh, so I can't put him in that category. Peter Yan, I don't think he's ready. Um, so what, what do you think about this, Jason? You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit surprised. And, I, you know, because we've talked about it so much on the show, um, it's from the forum. I would hope the forum would be a little wiser. Uh, just, <laughs> 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 I would hope that they try to be a little smarter, marks a little bit. But uh, yeah, I'm surprised as to who was number one. I get it. I totally get it. I mean, I'm not. I'm surprised and not surprised. I'm not surprised because that seems to be the the popular pick. But a little bit surprised. I was hoping they'd be better than that. We've talked so much about he needs to really probably go back to flyway and fight Joseph Benavides. And also, I feel kind of bad for for Al Jermaine Sterling a little bit. Like I know his wins are maybe the Jimmy Rivera may not not be as flashy as Car Cody Garber, but he's great. I mean, even the UFC has him ranked higher than Pedro Munoz. So even the UFC thinks he's a uh, you know slightly higher than Pedro Munoz. Pedro Munoz, I totally get. You know, in the interview I had with him, he talked about in other interviews he talked about that he wants a title shot next. Um, I, in my opinion, I, I would like to have seen Al Jermaine a little higher. I would like to have seen him be the number two. I mean, technically, he based on rankings, he should be the next guy but um the others are strange uh you know to for the others to be higher than algebra like if it was like it would make more sense to me it was like 43 for suhudo you know 20 for for pedro and like 20 so algebra getting four percent like damn the disrespect to algebra that's that's a little unsettling especially for others like dominic cruz he just says on the shelf and garbrand who's lost three in a row like come on now so and Peter Yan, come on, Peter Yan, get the hell out of here, people! Stop it. And now, I actually, my personal opinion on this one, I would rather see Marlon Moraes versus Pedro Munoz. Um, I, I think that would be the the better fight to put on right now. And no disrespect to Aljamain Sterling, I think if you put him in that spot, that makes all the sense in the world. The guy's on a three fight win streak um, after his his loss to Marlon Moraes. But I also like the concept of building up to a rematch. Um, so I would like to see Aljamain get that signature win over somebody. Um, and then you can start if, if Marlon uh, makes it out of that fight with Pedro Munoz, which I would anticipate him to do. Uh, then you start putting that together and you bill it as this epic rematch. 
uh, and, and and to see how much Aljo has improved since that would be, I think, a, a more long term approach to to creating a, a, an event that's worth watching. Uh, I just don't like the idea of just throwing these guys into uh, the these these rematches so fast. Now, I know Aljo has had three fights since that, that he's uh, emerged victorious in. But we're talking about less than two years ago, like more like a year and a half or so since he was knocked out. Uh, by, by Marlon, I really, really would like to see just one more, build it up, make it epic. I think I, ha the, I think I have, I have an answer for something like that. I mean, if they do Pedro Munoz, Mar Mar Marlon Marais, and I, Marais, and I've heard it suggested they should do that on the same card as, is it Nama Yunus and Andrade? That's in Brazil, right? Right, that's uh, 237. Yeah, so if they did that as a main event, in Brazil or Coleman event, whatever, that'd be good. And especially if like what you're saying, you want, you would like to see Al Jermaine get one more bigger fight. What is your thoughts on Al Jermaine versus a Sun Sal? Cause a Sun Sal is kind of stuck right now. Cause Marlon Marais is going to get that, that fight. And because he just beat him, he's kind of stuck. He can't get into that fight. So if Al Jermaine beats a Sun Sal, that's a pretty signature when he's been one of the best bantamweights of the last six, seven years, right along with Cruz, Garbrandt and TJ. Uh, and if somehow a Sun Sal beat him, I mean, that says a lot. And maybe you sell as, oh, he's st a still elite. He beat Al Jermaine, who's number three. And maybe you sell the trilogy of those two because a Sun Sal originally beat Marais in his debut, right? Right. So maybe you right. if Marais gets past Pedro Munoz, which is possible, you sell that, tr that trilogy fight. Or if Pedro Munoz somehow beat Marais, a Sun Sal Pedro Munoz would be still be a fresh matchup and noteworthy too. Right, I mean, I, I don't, any of those um, combinations sounds good. Mm. Like you, you can't really go wrong any any direction you go in that. Now, even and that also includes Henry Cejudo as far as the action in the cage. It's just that, and we've been very vocal about this. Like the the idea of shutting down the flyweight division would be an absolute certainty mm. if Henry Cejudo were to fight for the undisputed one thirty five pound belt. Now, we know that that was kind of in the works, but depending on how this plays out, this is something that could save flyweight. If they decide to just go with a pure bantamweight fight for mm -hmm. that title, yep. hey, you, you got some chance for flyweight to breathe. Henry Cejudo, I seriously doubt he's going to just sit around and wait uh, for, for more of these things to play out. I would anticipate him wanting to get back in the cage. And hey, Joseph Benavidez is waiting, and he's got a win over Cejudo. Put it together. You know, uh, um, uh, Juche Formiga and uh, Figueroa are fighting yeah. this weekend. Yep. You could have a number one contender emerge from that. So there are very good things that could be done at flyweight. And, and I just don't want to see that division get shut down, um, especially when you have this level of uncertainty at the division above. Yeah. And you could, I mean, what's unfortunate. Everything you said is, is correct, but I really feel like it's going to be Cejudo in there, especially based off the back and forth Cejudo and Marais had last night on Twitter, which was pretty good because Cejudo reminds me of like John Jones in a way and that when he tries to be charismatic and clever, it just doesn't seem genuine and it's kind of falls flat. But he has some good zingers, Marais, last night and back and forth. And it's funny too because both of them have the same manager, so I don't know if they – are working together to try to get that fight to happen to keep that title in house, or if this same manager is tweeting from both of their accounts. That too, that very was possible. the first thing I thought about because the the rumors have have flown around that that their manager tweets on the fighters' accounts. Mm. I as the first thing I thought when I saw this was like, oh, he's tweeting himself. Mm. That 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 was my first thought. He's tweeting himself. Um, yeah. Hilarious. I, I hope that's what happened because the image of that is really funny to me. I know. Um, Does he do dual phones? Does he do the phone and the computer? Yeah, and you switch you know, accounts so. real quick. Like, yeah. The, the problem is if you don't press the right button and you don't switch the accounts, then it's just mm. kind of kind of weird there. Yeah, I think yeah. we we've seen a few players in in other sports get caught up uh, tweeting from dummy accounts. You know what? Um, I don't think and it's not Ali, the names though, over. Because if you what you know you see Ali Ali's feed, his English isn't too good. Uh, his English is pretty good, man. I I don't know. I've seen some of his tweets and I'm like, a few times, man. He's he his English is spot on. He can talk. I've saw it so uh, unless unless someone else is tweeting from his account as he does the fires, he's tweeted something today. I didn't know what the hell he was saying. But everybody's got that left. that nonsensical tweet though. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was something. It was it, it was, was bad. 
I have to check it out. It was bad. I, I had to look yeah, at it. it but, was, I was like, what the fuck is he saying? I don't know. <laughs> but his, his, his English is not a problem for, for, for mm-hmm. Ali. English is not his problem at all. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, the guy is the guy's a smooth talker. I'll give him that. And yeah. he's, he's just a sharp dresser. Except for the turtlenecks. Not feeling the turtlenecks. No, no. And turtlenecks are trash anyway. But that's another story. <laughs> All right. So let's move on from, from that. Uh, this is from Joker Jiu-Jitsu. Why not a tournament? Peter Yan versus Marlon Marais. Henry Cejudo versus Pedro Munez. What do you think, man? Why, why is everybody trying to get Peter Yan? Is Peter Yan, the person that brought this up, is he the same one who voted for Peter Yan in the poll? Like Peter, Peter like, Yan is lurking on the forums as yeah, we speak, voting seriously. for himself. Peter, I respect you, but come on. We're not we're not there yet. We're not there. I see Peter Young's very busy. He's gone from Pedro Munoz talking trash about him to I think he was trying to call out maybe. Oh, yeah, he's trying to uh, call out Cody Garbrandt today, calling him the no chin Garbrandt and stuff like that. So he, he's trying to get a fight with anybody to get noticed at this point. But um, a, a, a tournament would be fun. Um, it would be funny, too, because uh, this that's the thing right now in the last year or so. But um. Yeah, I'm going to be against a tournament. That would be really fun, interesting. And if they want to do an eight man, if Peter Young gets in that way, cool. If they want to just do a four man and just say, look, we're unsure who to put in this match, so everybody's included. So we're going to have all four of you in different matches, and you know, the winner, just like they did to start the flyweight title. That would be a fair way, and pr- maybe that's in their best interest just to do it that way, so everybody's happy, you know. And maybe you know the I don't know. Yeah, I, I like it though. Yeah, I'm, I'm not opposed to the idea of a title, but what the reason why I would not want it this time is because we have in Marlon Marais, we have a guy who very, very yeah. clearly has yeah. earned a title shot. And quite frankly, he earned a title shot before he beat a Sun Sal. Mm-hmm. And at the same, a Sun Sal had earned his title shot before that. So there, there has been a clear progression of guys who have earned their spot who were not given it, you know, and other things were allowed to happen and 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 now we're in this position. Mm. So I say let's let's skip the the formalities and just give the guy who earned his shot a spot there and the opponent we can have a debate about. But aside from that, Marlon Marais should be in the next Bantamweight title fight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's no with uh, TJ Dillashaw, with Henry Cejudo, with any other iteration of the UFC Bantamweight title. Uh, the, the guy with uh, the red tape on his gloves – should be Marlon Marais right now. Yeah, I agree. All right, so let's move on from that one. Um, uh, next question. I guess we got a, a combo here uh, from our, our resident jokester, uh, Europe One, <laughs> and, and H- Hooligani. Mm, that seems right. Yeah, okay. Um, aren't they going to scrap Flyweight? Why haven't they officially announced that it's closing yet? And that's a good question. It's a real good question. I'm surprised it's being dragged out this long and the champion hasn't, you know, defended it. I mean, the champ, the former champion who got traded and has been on the silence for four months, he's about to fight and hit that division again before the champion of the USC. Demetrius Johnson is going to go fight in one next week, you know, and, and, and Cejudo still hasn't gone back and fought flyaway after winning the title, which is shameful. I mean, you know, it, it's weird. Like, I don't know. I mean, maybe all indications are they're going to scrap it, but they just haven't yet. It's weird. It's like they're going PFL and just going to have like a, a eight man roster or eleven man roster, and it's a season, and I, and that's it. But it's it's very odd. I'm not really sure what they're doing. I saw somewhere today that a fighter that maybe just got signed or is it even the company was ranked. On the flyweight listing on the UFC.com. If, if, if Jay, you can look that up. I, I could have on Twitter. Someone that's not even in the company was ranked on the flyweight. I don't know. I could be wrong, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. I'm very confused. It's, it's a completely odd situation. I don't know what the hell they're doing at this point. Yeah, I, I don't know what the the reasoning behind all of this is because there's been a cl- a pretty clear, consistent path of every flyweight fight that's happened, the loser gets cut. Mm. Um, so this has just repeatedly happened and they haven't, um, you know, with, uh, uh, Figueroa and, and Formiga fighting, they know sort of, Hey, this could be the, the next guy up or Joseph Benavidez. He could be the next guy up. There's, there's been no sort of like nothing, like nothing to indicate that this is leading anywhere, uh, and while they're cutting guys. And it was already the smallest, uh, size roster, on the and then the, uh, among the the men's divisions in the UFC, so I don't know what they're doing. I don't know why they're pretending. Um, I, I guess for 
for contractual reasons, I, I, I would mm -hmm. assume because of course they, I guess they have a harder time cutting someone after a win. So they just let them all beat each other up and then cut the loser. I, I, I really can't call it. And uh, Jay also just dropped a, a, yeah, a job, nugget Jay. on us. Yeah, he um, he says, uh, Casey Kenny ranked at flyweight, but he is fighting tomorrow for the interim bantamweight title in LFA. So, <laughs> what the hell? Bang up job, uh, UFC rankings. Um, what, what a joke. The UFC rankings are <laughs> so terrible. But yeah, I, I don't get it. I mean, what's the point? Like, what do you have to gain by just dragging this out? It's mm -hmm. not the writing is clearly on the wall. Everyone from fans to media to the fighters themselves are, are speculating all of it. Um, I, I, I just don't get it. Uh, and even more interesting about that, um, uh, the gentleman uh, that we just talked of, Casey Kenny, has never actually competed in the UFC. He went one and one on the contender series, yet finds his way in the UFC rankings despite fighting in a different promotion tomorrow. That's so, going to be an yes. awesome trivia question in five to ten years. <laughs> what, like, <laughs> what fighter wow. was ranked in the UFC but never fought in the UFC? Hey, what a, what a joke! What an absolute joke! Um, just uh, this is trash. All right, so question. Uh, I forget the numbers because I, I went out of order. Uh, Dim. Very simple name. As mm -hmm. is Cejudo technically the lineal bantamweight champion? No. No, they fought at 125. No. <laughs> hey, from Captain Credential himself, I, I, I can't <laughs> expound on that any further. Um, but I will because this is a show where we are supposed to talk. Like I get, um, I, I get it if yeah. you if you say that he is the the lineal bantamweight champion because yeah. he did beat T.J. Dillashaw. Mm -hmm. That that is that is a very understandable argument to make. But weight classes exist for a reason. Mm -hmm. Um. At 135 pounds, TJ Dillashaw has not been defeated in quite some time. Mm -hmm. Hey, that Henry Cejudo fought him in another realm. So, uh, yeah, you can say you can say that Cejudo uh, has the rights to compete for the 135 pound title, but no, he is not the lineal champion at bantamweight. It's like saying John Jones is John Jones the lineal heavyweight champion. No. Yes, I get that he beat the heavyweight champion, but you know the different weight class, this situation, and TJ's even worse. He had to cut down to a place he shouldn't have never been, as we're all seeing now. Right, and under that logic, Matt Hamill is in fact the greatest fighter go. of all time. There you have so it. So Matt Hamill mm -hmm. is is the lineal heavyweight champion. Well, actually, exactly. well, he's lost since then. So what? But that's another story. But you get <laughs> how ridiculous it is to, to go down this rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. If you fight in a weight class, that's the weight class it counts in. So uh, we'll, we'll leave it I at mean, that. Conor McGregor is actually still then the lineal featherweight champion. Right. He's still – or you could say Khabib Nurmagomedov is the lineal featherweight champion. That's true. You <laughs> Like, it, like it, you see how ridiculous this gets. Hey, Floyd Mayweather. Is the lineal Boy, featherweight Mayweather, champion? Yes, he is. He also <laughs> defended his title against Tenshin Nasakawa. Like <laughs> yep. it, it gets more and more ridiculous uh -huh. the, the more you talk it out and think this out. So let's not get too crazy. <laughs> I, I'm a big believer in lineal belts and and lineal titles and and keeping that heritage alive. Um, but there is a point in time where you stop it. I, you I got another. I got another good one. Until the last pay per view. Or a couple two, two pair of views ago, Tyron Willie fought. Dory McDonald was the belt tour champion, and then the lineal welterweight UFC champion too. He was a two promotion champion. Who knew? Yeah, like who, who knew? <laughs> who, who knew? So, like, yeah, this is just really confusing, and it's a nonsensical yeah. argument. So it, it, it's just going to drive me crazy to think about it any further. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna switch gears uh, just a bit here. Um, now let me let me double check this this list here because are you going back to the top? I, I'm going back to the top, but here's here's something that's missing here. Mm -hmm. We were not asked any questions about um, ESPN taking over the UFC pay per views, and oh. I, I think we'd, it'll be irresponsible of us to to go through this broadcast despite no questions being asked of us about it without us addressing that because quite frankly that's really the biggest news in mm -hmm. in MMA right now. That is the news. Um, that we really need to be talking about. 
Roberts. I mean, it's it's uh, oh, mean, oh, I oh, you know what? <laughs> My dumb ass ain't even reading these questions right because we do have a question about that. So we're gonna jump out of order again. From let's just go back to one. No, 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 no. We can do this first. We gotta go this. Oh my god! Order (laughs) a little bit because we go out of order again. All right. So this question is uh, fuck off. (laughs) Fuck off. Fuck off. Fuck off. Yeah. So he says, "How soon does the (laughs) UFC notice they effed up by ditching cable box fans?" I don't think. They would not make that decision if they thought they, thought they were going to lose money. Like they, they, actually, this is a really genius, smart business decision by the UFC. It sucks for fans, and that's what they often – they make some decisions that can be difficult for their fighters, and now they make one that's kind of difficult for certain fans, not all fans. But if you look at the pay-per-view numbers in the last couple of years, they're not what they once were just because I think the product – has been watered down a little bit because there is so much content. You got the PFLs, you got the ones, you got the Bellator. So there's much more. So people are being very selective with pay-per-views anyway. Um, so the numbers are down and, and we've talked about it here and I've talked about it a bunch in this day and age. It's the TV deal where the money's at, you know, you see with the NFL, all these other sports league, but now we're seeing it in fight sports. I mean, the real first time was WWE, you know, going away from pay-per-view and doing their network. But then they got these massive deals we talked about. They got Fox USA. Now the UFC's got this massive deal with ESPN that that takes their reach to a whole nother level, brings prestige to the brand. And what's and what's huge about this is they already had a five-year deal. Now you get two more years guaranteed from, from ESPN because this isn't like sports where, oh, ESPN's going to opt out of the deal. No, they're going to – Fill that full, fulfill that whole deal. So two more years guaranteed from ESPN. Seven years. They'll probably. I was reading an article. They may maybe still make some really good money off of this because pay per view. You know the, the the networks or the dish networks or everything. They take fifty percent of pay per view revenue. So they may end up getting a little bit more. It's hard to say, but they get two more guarantees from ESPN. Two more guaranteed years. They 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 have the brand. And I like I was telling. I think it was um one of our fellow writers uh, on sure dog on Twitter that it's, I really feel like the people that are ordering the pay-per-views now mo- probably most likely already have ESPN plus. So the numbers may go down a little bit, but I don't think they will be too crazy. Anyway, I don't think it's going to go from like an average of say 300,000 to like 60,000. I don't think it's anything like that. Maybe like 50,000, but it may go back up anyway. But, um, you know, the, the, I think it was Matt Hunter who brought up a great question of when does the ESPN Plus membership start going up? And I think that's going to come. And then people are going to go off. You know, when, once it's up to like $10 a month, it's not going to be as fun anymore. But I, I don't think it was a bad move. I actually think it was rather brilliant. Yeah, I mean, as far as uh, how it affects the UFC, it's just going to line their pockets up more. Mm-hmm. You, you know, it was very widely publicized that they were having disputes with DirecTV and with yep, some true, of yeah. these other other um, pay-per-view cable providers about the percentage that they were taking. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and as you said before, it's like, yeah, it was about 50% that was getting taken off the top of all their pay-per-view sales. Mm-hmm. Um which was one reason why they were pushing Fight Pass. Yep. If you order through Fight Pass, they get 100% of that. Yep. Um, and it was a very big deal to have your pay-per-views going through Fight Pass. Um, so so now with uh, ESPN taking the helm, you know, they're not disclosing the percentage that ESPN is getting, but I guarantee you it is less than 50%. Yeah. I'm pretty certain of that because otherwise it wouldn't make sense for, for the UFC. Um and of course, or the pay per view price drops from sixty five percent to sixty. Um, I mean, sixty five dollars to sixty dollars. But hey, if you're if you're spending five bucks on the subscription to ESPN Plus, which is now a requirement to order the pay per view, mm-hmm. it's about the same. Okay, fine, whatever. But the idea of putting a paywall behind a paywall is baffling to me. <laughs> it's baffling because when when it's time to take someone's money. You want to make the handing over the money process as simple as possible. Mm-hmm. If you add steps to complicate handing over money, people stop handing over money. You, you know, I, like think about this for the, the casual fans that the UFC caters to so much. The reason why we have Brock Lesnar and CM Punk and, and some of these signees, signings that don't make sense or matchmaking that seems crazy, but it attracts attention. The reason behind all of that is the casual fan. You know, so this casual fan, you can rely on to buy three pay-per-views a year, maybe. 
four if you're really lucky uh, on the year, depending on how many big names are available and active and and, and uninjured. Mm. Um, but how much do those casuals care about those several pay-per-views a year? Do they care enough to spend um, a monthly fee every month just in case one of those pay-per-views happens? I doubt it. I, I, I highly doubt it. Um, then you got to think, okay, um, you put this behind a paywall. Now you're just complicating things for someone who doesn't have a Roku or an Apple TV or some sort of app where they can just watch it on their TV. Um, and then it becomes an issue. Oh, you got to pay this, but then you got to pay this after. And it, to, to make this so complex, how many guys uh, in this demographic are, that don't care about fights all that much, but they just want to see McGregor? Mm-hmm. When it's time to order that that pay per view, and they see how 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 much more uh, th- there is involved in it, say, eh, I'll just go to a bar and hit on women. Like, eh, I'll just go drinking with my friends. I- I'll just watch something else. Like, there is, it's no guarantee that these same people are going to stick around. Mm. So when you make it harder for them to watch it, eh, you you make it less likely that they're going to be invested in the product. Now, of course, with ESPN uh, becoming even more involved with the UFC now, yes, they're going to push it. They're going to push it all. You've seen it on Sports Center already. You see the ticker at the bottom of the screen with all these, all these like base, like really basic MMA news that means something to us, but means nothing to anyone else in the world uh, across the screen all day long. So yeah, we, we're seeing that happen, but still a paywall behind a paywall required to pay a monthly fee <laughs> for the right and the privilege to give you more money. You know, get the fuck out of here. You know, and, and like everything you're saying is right. I think I almost feel like it's another way of, I think the UFC is probably of the point where they probably know a pay-per-view is dying, but they still like to have the revenue source. But if they're able to trade pay-per-view to, strengthen their relationship with ESPN and guarantee two more years, I think they're willing to make that trade. And that's what I feel like. I feel like in the end, and maybe it was Matt Hunter also, maybe the main point, somebody made a point that, you know, we're going to just probably get to a place where, or the UFC should get to a place if they want to be in that same breath as the NFL. Of, and they don't need pay-per-view after a while. So I think that's where we're going. I think this is a signal that they're just going to let pay-per-view eventually die and ESPN will eventually let it die as, as they, the subscriptions go up and they force some people to go up and they continue to build that, that connection and get you know UFC out to even more eyeballs than it ever has before to the point where if UFC is making them a lot of money from the ESPN shows and on being on the network in terms of advertising dollars in any way, they're really not going to need pay-per-view. Neither of them are going to need pay-per-view and they're going to be making a lot of money anyway. So... Uh, everything you said is correct, and they will lose some fans. But I think, in a greater scheme, they're just they're letting they're letting you know, in a way, pay per view is gonna die soon. All right, and, but if you're one of the fighters who gets pay per view, yes, yeah, that's messed up. Ultra, ultra piss right yeah. now. That's you like the Reebok be. deal. That's like bad, like the Reebok deal. Like yeah. you had no say in this, and you just got this bad news of, of lost revenue. That is just wrong well there's a whole lot of blank project spearhead cards right about now <laughs> yeah. It, yeah you know i, I just I, I just don't under i mean i'm not even going to go down that rabbit hole right now but if you are someone who who gets those pay-per-view points you should be really upset right yep. now because your money has been cut up yep because there is i i guarantee you for ufc 236 and ufc 237 there's going to be a significant drop in the paychecks of the people who have pay-per-view points. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that I can almost guarantee you. Of course, we won't know this for sure because those figures will not be released. If you thought it was tough to get numbers from uh, for about UFC sales before, oh, it's going to be real tough now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's going to be real tough now because yeah. you can only get them from one source. Yeah, you can't. From from my understanding uh, of how Dave Meltzer worked. Uh, getting his numbers and he has been the go-to source for pay-per-view estimates for years at this point mm-hmm. was that he get numbers or, or some idea of what it was from one provider and be mm-hmm. able to estimate what it was from there. Oh, okay. and, and for the most part, that seems accurate. Like you can, you can form a, a pretty accurate uh, standard number on that, mm-hmm. but it's only one source now. 
It's only one source. So and they're not going to tell us nothing. <laughs> they we <laughs> don't going to hear anything. a damn thing. Yep. Okay, we won't hear anything. It's going to be it's going mum is the word mm -hmm. around around Endeavor and around uh Bristol, Connecticut. All right. <laughs> you ain't going to hear a whole lot. Uh but I will say, I will say this man too. Um I have been uh, a very vocal complainer about ESPN's pl ESPN plus streaming quality. That might mm. sound ironic to people who saw the original broadcast of today's show. So what? I didn't see anything. <laughs> yeah, that was a problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so like now um, every week when we watch an event on ESPN plus, I consistently have stalls in the broadcast. I consistently have, buffering periods and just weird things that don't happen when I watch Netflix, don't happen when I watch Hulu, don't happen when I watch the zone that, that don't bother me on any other streaming service that I have. Did you, did you have issues with the UFC London? Yes, I did. I did. You know, it's weird. I just subscribed now for UFC London and I had no problems at all, but I feel like I've had more problems with the zone, which is odd enough. Okay, yeah, maybe it's a, like a local server thing or something. But but the the point that I'm getting at is this: is like I've consistently have a good quality of streaming when I've ordered pay per views through YouTube, when I've ordered them through Amazon, when I've ordered mm -hmm. them through PlayStation Network. Yeah. Um, Sling TV, ass crack. Sling TV is horrible. I will trash them every chance I get. Um, but but the, those other three. I've never had a single problem. I've never had a single um, second stall out on me or the same five second clip repeat or do something weird like that. Mm. But it happens on ESPN Plus. So now I'm going to pay you $60 to, to watch this happen again. I, I'm telling you, they better fix whatever server problems they have whatever issues with bandwidth or whatever it is that causes the frequent errors on ESPN plus they better fix it because there will be people steaming mad uh, <laughs> about paying more money after they're paying money to get a low quality streaming product. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, just a little bit uh, to, to think about, man. I, hopefully those issues are resolved before um, 236 next week. Correct. 236. 236 is next week or the week after? I think it's next. Yeah. Okay. Because this is Nashville this week, and I think it's 236 was the one after that. I don't think there's any fight nights in between Nashville and 236. Okay. I mean, it's just at this point, it's hard to keep up. Um, yeah. But anyway, I think you guys get the point. Rant over. <laughs> Maybe I'll start another one. I don't know. Depends mm -hmm. on how I feel. All right. So now we're going to move uh, to the original order. Of the questions, all right, all right. Yeah, I've jumped all over the place. Um, so this is from uh, Drunken Volchanskin. Yes, I would really like for you to take a closer look at the strategy Masvidal used versus Till. The takedown, uh, feints, hand placement, and stand switches are really going under the radar around here. That was a beautiful performance. What do you say, Jason? Um, I don't think it's anything too uncommon from Jorge Masvidal, honestly. I mean, yeah, I'm sure without a doubt there's some tricks he had for Till just to change it up, like mentioning the takedown fates is great, and I'm surprised more people don't do it, but Jorge Masvidal is a very smart fighter. He's a very smart tactical fighter, and he has strategy. You know, the, the interesting thing about Jorge Masvidal was that he was pro he's been kind of smallish probably for 170, 155 cutting weight has always been a problem and tough for him. He's he's the tweener. He's a real – he'd be a 165 killing machine. He's, that's probably his best weight. So And also, he's just not a guy that often has big power. I know we saw it against uh, Till, but for me, the Till punch is more one of those you don't see it coming perfectly executed kind of punches. And that's always been the thing that's held him back. He doesn't have punch power, but that man, that man we talked about a bunch on the show. He gives a tough time for everybody because he's very smart. He doesn't. He's not a brawler that comes forward and it's hard to put away. He's not like John Lineker who's just coming forward, coming forward and throwing hooks. No, he's a fantastic boxer for MMA, and he knows foot placement. He knows movement. He's good defensively. He mixes it up like you, like you mentioned, drunken. Like he he adds the feints and hand placement, all these kind of things, footwork, where his feet's at. He's just a smart fighter, and and it, it needs to be respected. Hopefully, more people respect him after this. Um, he should have got it after the Cerrone fight, the Cerrone fight, but I guess maybe Cerrone was like on a decline and now he's risen up again and now Till's a bigger name. But this guy's been a sleeper, really talented fighter. 
that just you know has come up short in some big mo big moments for a long time now. But he's like to me like a Jacare in that he's one of those really really good fighters that not enough people really pay attention to. Yeah, I, I agree with you, man. We we've seen this from Jorge Masvidal uh, many times over. The only thing that I think is is different is that he was he was able to like adjust on the fly a little better than we've mm -hmm. seen him do previously. That's kind of the only difference. But like the stand switch was crazy. I mean, the stand switch is what is what set up the knockout. I mean, he did he did some really really good work in there. Uh, but like you said, man, Jorge Masvidal has been criminally underrated. For a very long time, mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about a guy who most of his losses have been debatable decisions, like the the ally uh, Quinta fight. Pretty clearly, he won that fight. You know, two fights later for Al, he was in a short notice bout against Khabib Nurmagomedov. Uh, he loses a very close decision to Damian Maya. Damian Maya's next fight is for the welterweight title against Tyron Woodley. Uh, so he's been in he's been in sniffing distance of a title for a very very long time and just just kind of couldn't either convince the judges or uh or, or fight with the right mentality at you know at that particular time i mean he he does have a a, a rather street fighters approach um, to the mm -hmm. way he looked at a fight, which I think has has worked against him many times when when the judges read the scores. Uh, but but Jorge Masvidal has been one of the consistently tougher uh, and more intelligent fighters that we've had at 155 or 170 for a very long time. And there aren't too many people that are eager to fight him mm -hmm. for a reason. You know, the, the same guy who just knocked out Darren Till, who's highly touted as a striker, was the same guy who damn near out grappled Damian Maya. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that's a that's a dangerous man, and that's a that's an ugly matchup for just about everybody at either 155 or 170. Uh, so yeah, pay attention to Jorge Masvidal. What we saw from him Saturday, we've seen a lot. Uh, it didn't maybe result in dramatic knockouts, but th but the strategy has always been there. The 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 tactical skills, the the technique has always been there. And, and and it's good that people are finally noticing what a lot of us have been seeing for a very, very long time. And I just want to mention his record and his resume. And just it's it's so impressive. Darren Till, we know, knockout. Knockout win. Steven Thompson, he lost by decision. Didn't get finished. I mean, listen, on, on his career, he's been in 46 fights, has been finished early three times. 46 fights. And as I go through some of these names, it's going to be even that much more impressive. He's only been stopped three times. Steven Thompson, which is a he's a tough matchup for any pure boxer, just a tough matchup, long range, he moves feet, karate. Damian Maya, does a split decision loss, beat Cerrone, knocked out uh, uh, also TK Ellenberger in the first round. Ross Pearson beat him. Lorenz Larkin lost, split decision. Benson Henderson lost, split decision. You know, his loss to Ali, uh, like you mentioned, Ali Quinta, three rounds, split decision. He beat Kraus, he beat Pat Healy when Pat Healy was a different good guy, difficult guy to deal with. He's got a widow with Michael Chiesa. He subbed Michael Chiesa. Bravo yes. choke. Yes. yes. <laughs> Nuts. He, he beat Tim Means, who had been durable. Gilbert Melendez, he, he lost a decision uh, five rounds. Assist. I remember that fight. I was a big Gilbert Melendez fan at the time of Strike Force, and I was like, oh, God, he's got to run through this Jorge Masvidal guy. He got subbed by Toby Amada upside down. He's not going to be. He gave Jorge Masvidal a really tough fight. BKG Noons when it mattered. You know, he lost to – I remember he, his loss to Paul Daly back in, in 2010 – Paul Daly went for takedowns in that fight because he didn't want none on the feet with this man, and he moved up well to it back in that time. I mean, it, it, I've been looking at – he fought a, a Rafael Asuncao <laughs> back in 2005. Lost. Decision. It, it just – what a career, man. It's like, you, you nailed it. Criminally underappreciated. Yeah, man. Like, uh, Jorge Masvidal has been putting it on people for a very, yep. very, very long time. Um, all right, so – um, keeping in this same path right here, a, a question from another regular, Yo Jimbo, what it do, brother? Mm -hmm. um, he asks, at UFC London, Till went after Askren, and we all know what happened between Masvidal and Edwards. Are these two grudge matches uh, that the UFC should book? Uh, that boy, man, that Till Askren fight has so much less sizzle now. You know, after that loss, unfortunately, that, that fight is just so less interesting. Um, Masvidal Edwards makes a ton of sense. That's a fight everybody will see. They're both, you know, Edwards is high. He's on a winning streak. Edwards, he, he hasn't even, he's, is he undefeated? Am I no, right? no. So his last loss was to uh, Kamara Usman. Ah, uh, right. But is that his only loss? 
Uh, I think he might have one more loss. Let me double check that. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure Jay is going to pop up in the chat. With <laughs> yeah, he's going to pop in the chat. But I'm looking up right now. Keep keep going. Uh, seventeen and three. I just found it. Oh, three. But, okay. But um, you know that has that fight has it's easy to sell right now. But I tell you, before that, I saw the whole background backstage incident between the two. I really had a lot of interest in Askren versus Masvidal actually because Masvidal made some really interesting comments calling Askren a coward because he didn't want to take on Robbie Lawler after a questionable loss. Um, you know that's an easy sell. Masvidal trying to avenge a loss for his ATT teammate against Askren would be fascinating. Askren facing another kind of sprawl and brawl talented guy in Moswell been interesting. And Moswell, as we saw with Dave Meyer, probably a better grappler than Robbie Lawler, so he would not make it easy for Askren. Got a great gas tank. He's not going to tire even if so Askren can't finish him, and he's not doing things in like a third round. Moswell, I mean, like I feel like that fight could be very interesting. Um, but Edwards and Moswell, I wouldn't turn down till Askren – I'm f- I'm really not too interested in that fight right now because I'd like to see Askren make his way to a title shot and a questionable win and then beating Till off of two straight losses does nothing for him. So yeah, I'm with you on that, man. Till versus Askren just means nothing. Like it just mm-hmm. it, it, it's a pointless fight. It'll be something fun to watch and it'll be fun to see the build up of it. Yeah. But but it's it's a fight that we don't need. Uh, it's not good for Askren at this point. It does it does nothing to elevate him. Um, it's not good for Till because it puts him at a at a horrible stylistic disadvantage uh, mm. in, in a lot of ways. Um, and so and and he, and honestly, he doesn't need to have that level of spotlight on him at the at this time. He needs to kind of go back to the drawing board and, and start focusing more on developing as opposed to becoming a star. Um, I and and even and even though Masvidal versus Edwards happened backstage and you know and it and it was funny and we all talked about it and laughed and got all the jokes off, I I don't think that fight makes a lot of sense for Masvidal. Mm. If you're Masvidal, you should be aiming higher. I say go after Askren. Uh, that's the fight that that should happen at least if Masvidal wants to get to get get to the title, which uh, it sounds like he does. Um, mm-hmm. You know, of course, uh, Masvidal versus Edwards would make an excellent fight. That that would be a very great, uh, very great fight, and that probably would be a more entertaining fight to watch than Masvidal versus Askren. But if you're talking about progression, if you're talking about moving up, and you're talking about going after the belt, fighting a guy who's ranked underneath of you, and, and it's just getting uh, people to pay attention to him. I, I I wouldn't do that if I'm asked at all. Mm. I would if I'm Edwards. Yeah, I want that. If if I'm Edwards, I want for one the the redemption of getting pieced up and, and backstage at, at at this fight to, to redeem myself where it counts, where I get paid to do it, where millions of people are 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 watching it live, anticipating a fight. Yeah, mm. I want that. And he's a higher ranked name. Yes, I'll take it. But if you're Masvidal, no, 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 move up higher. Um, that fight, that that fight is always going to be there at this point. You've always got that heat. You can always the UFC already got that commercial filmed. So you go ahead and table that, and go ahead if you're a Jorge Masvidal, move up. Go ahead, Askren. All right, all right. All right so um, Europe One asks, was Masvidal's fiendish attack? on the renowned gentleman, Leon Edwards, a calculated media move? No, not at all. That was, you want to talk shit in the streets kind of response, you know, like, and he said it in, in his, his, his comments afterwards, after the whole thing happened, that's a dude, like, there's some people that you can talk that shit and yell and it's all the stuff. And then some guys like, ah, oh, whatever, or get bothered, whatever. And then there's some guys that if you talk that shit and walk by, they're gonna walk up to you and say, say to my face. <laughs> and that's what Jorge Masvidal did. He walked up to him, said, say to my face, and then he showed him the fist, you know, and, and he gave him the three piece with the soda. You know, it, it was just simple. That's something you see in the street all the time in the, the not as good side of town. That's just life, you know, in in respect, uh, a respect, code of respect thing from people that live that kind of life. And that's all that was. Not media, what there was no media, that was life. <laughs> I was straight life right there. Yeah, he interrupted media 
to give yeah. you real life. Like <laughs> yes. that, that's that's yes. what happened there. That was not an act. That was not a put on. That was not a show. That was a guy who said, hey, you you talking shit. All right, get dealt with like that. Yeah. It, it was that simple there. And there, there's really no other way to interpret that. <laughs> nope. um, and, and then you see how how cold and calculated it was. Mm -hmm. It was it was like there was like this ruthless efficiency to it where he didn't, <laughs> yep. he, he didn't bat an eyelash. He nope. didn't. It, there was no wasted words. Mm -hmm. There was no wasted energy. It was just action. Mm -hmm. um, that, my friends, is street shit. <laughs> okay. yep. That's all it is. Yes. Uh, I would expect nothing less from the guy who literally came yes. up street fighting. Yep. That was his introduction to MMA is street fighting. Yep. He, he wasn't at wasn't uh wrestling uh in junior high and mm -hmm. he wasn't he didn't his nope. daddy didn't take him to a jujitsu school when he was seven <laughs> no no nope. he was knocking fools out yep. so that that's what happened there all right um uh from frank mcegger uh he asked do you guys agree with jorge masador not receiving any punishment for his three-piece combo <laughs> with a soda on leon edwards um he probably should. I mean, you know, you got to be professional. If somebody talks some trash, I mean, it's both of them. You know, Edwards talking the trash is kind of is unprofessional on, on on its own, and then him handling it the way is unprofessional. You know, saved the fighting for the cage. I'm surprised Dana didn't punish him, but not then again, not. I was just surprised because he doesn't always jump to the offense of the fighters all the time. This one he quickly did and blamed his own staff. Um, I'm not sure what the staff could have did. You know, Lee Edwards is leaving. He's going somewhere. He starts yelling. He's not like they. He says, "Oh, staff, I'm going to yell and hype a fight." You know, so and then who's this? You know, this person interview Masvidal thinks they're just going to continue to interview. He's giggling, laughing a little bit. And who's who, how you know? I mean, I guess somebody could have jumped in, but you don't think it's going to escalate to that? You know, especially for a veteran like Masvidal, he's been around long enough. So, um, yeah, he probably should have got something. But if they if they don't, eh, whatever. I mean, he he, you know, I don't want to see him lose any money or anything like that. I, I mean, it's really not that big of a deal. It, it really is not. And, and if you if you are Dana White, this whole this whole like, oh my my staff is at fault. Yeah, you probably took those guys out for beers afterwards. <laughs> because all this is doing is going to line your pockets up even more. This is going to make people pay attention and care and watch. Yeah. I mean, th let's just take a look back to last fall. When yeah. a literal brawl broke out at T-Mobile Arena, and the and fans were were literally in danger, and there were there were people running away from from the chaos. The, there were people getting knocked out in the bathrooms, and and it was it was it was a, a literally a chaotic scene that I happened to see a lot of. With my <laughs> and, and, and I'm and Dana White went up there on that podium at that post fight presser and said that. They're not changing the way they promote fights. Oh, this happens. Oh, it's terrible, but hey, it happens. Like, they do not care. This is beautiful. They use the dolly being thrown at a bus exactly. in a commercial. Exactly. I was going to just say that. that they don't care. <laughs> like, if, you think, if you think this little this little scuffle, this little kerfuffle, this is nothing. <laughs> this is nothing. Nothing at all. They look. They overlook felonies. Okay? This is, this is nothing, man. Like, yeah, if anything, though the UFC people who let that happen, eh, they probably got a little bonus check. Um, <laughs> and, and 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 then on then on top of that, man, if you are one of those UFC staff members and you see two of the best welterweights in the world uh in in a in a street fight with each other, how eager are you to jump in that fray? I'm not, <laughs> yeah. If if Jorge Masvidal decided he wanted to walk over there and 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 punch somebody, hey, it's your world, brother. I'm, gonna, I'm stepping out your way. It's going to be a week s s separation. Like, yeah. Stop, I, stop. I, man, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> I'm not even going to try because they don't pay me enough for that. No. No. Yeah. yeah. Pass. <laughs> pass. <laughs> All right. So um, from Guy SP. Oh, very nice. The UFC recently signed featherweight Felicia Spencer and Norma Dumont. Uh, Viana, does that mean they are keeping the women's featherweight division? Yeah, I guess so. They're going to add to it. I mean, it's it's clearly the opposite of what they're doing with flyweight, and we're all on the assumption that's leaving. So I, I would guess so. I mean, if they're, it, it's going to be fascinating though because there's going to be a void if Cyborg just leaves after her neck her 
final final her deal and Nunez either a retires or go back to Banto or whatever and they lose both of them for the division I mean either way they're probably gonna lose both of them for the division within the next three to four years so I mean they're signing people clearly they're probably looking for new talent so yeah yeah I guess they're, they're gonna keep it around just see how it goes but I mean is anybody really that excited about it yeah, see, I I don't think this really means that they're going to keep the division necessarily. Mm. Maybe at least not. That the thing is, two people don't mean a division. Like, yeah. like so what? So what? Now they have three featherweights or four featherweights. <laughs> or like this, this is definitely not a division still. So they would have to have like like what they did when they brought in the the straw weights. They just uh they just s- stole everyone from Invicta. Mm. I would anticipate something like that if they were trying to keep this division. Mm. Um, but keep in mind, too, they were signing flyweights up until they just decided they didn't want them anymore. <laughs> That's true. It, you know, uh, Shorty Torres got signed and it was a big deal. And then mm-hmm. he was cut. It, you know, this is this doesn't really mean anything like you, it can give you hope. Uh, uh, maybe maybe they, they picked up a couple people that that either Cyborg, Amanda Nunes or or uh, Megan Anderson can fight, but I don't really see anything beyond that until some more activity happens in that regard. Mm. All right, so next question is, um, where is it? Because I went out of order. Here we go. I Frank think- McGregor again? Got it. No, 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 no. It is Frank McGregor again. Yeah, yeah, you're right. All right, so who do you guys like in the recently announced welterweight bout between Rafael Dos Anjos and debuting welterweight Kevin Lee in Rochester. Um, that's an interesting fight, and, and the, also interesting that, uh, that I read Lee. It was just an opportunity he couldn't turn down, but he plans to go back to lightweight. Um, I'm, I'm curious. I don't know. I feel like if he goes in there and he like the impressively be RDA, I don't see why he would need to go back to a division he has a lot of trouble cutting weight for. If he can just be a fast, strong, smaller welterweight, he should do it. But on the fight itself, um, really, it's, it's a good fight. They're, they're fairly evenly matched. RD is probably a bit of a, a better striker. Um, Lee's probably a bit of a better wrestler. But they're both, you know, skilled in striking, grappling. They're both well rounded. Uh, Lee feels a little more faster. Probably a little bit more athletic. This guy's to get experience. Uh, if I had to pick, make a pick right now, um, I'll go Kevin Lee. I mean, I'll go Kimberly, but I, I like the fight. It, it's it's a good. I wasn't sure what the Rochester card would get. You know, no disrespect to Rochester, but I didn't, you know, who knows? But that's a that's a solid main event for that card. Uh yeah, I'm I'm kind of feeling Kevin Lee to to win this fight. Also, I think the style matchup, I think it favors him. Hmm. Um, the fact that these are both guys who were yeah. lightweights fighting at welterweight, I don't think size is going to be become an issue mm-hmm. there. Um, and and I'm really curious as to what. Uh, a less depleted version of Kevin Lee looks like. I, yeah. I think that might be pretty scary um, for for a lot of people. Um, as far as his his long term prospects at welterweight, I don't know. I mean, I guess I just have to see what he looks like then. Uh, and even then, that's still not the the most accurate of gauges because RDA isn't a true welterweight. Yeah. So I it still will leave a lot of questions. Even if uh, Kevin Lee goes out there and smokes him, but but hey. Um, and, and I think this is a point that I, I made on um, on uh, Mixed Combat Radio last night, too, is that, I mean, Kevin Lee could go in there and win or lose, just say, hey, um, I didn't like how my body felt at 170. Maybe I, I dialed something different, uh, strength and conditioning-wise or nutrition-wise, and make 155 easier. Um, so there, there are different directions that this can go. And of course he can go in there and just feel incredible and yeah. Hey, this is where I belong. And he'll, he'll take being the shorter guy, uh, in order to have some of that advantage. But, um, but yeah, man, uh, I, I do like this fight for Kevin Lee. Uh, and despite RDA's success against, uh, some true welterweights like Robbie Lawler, like Neil Magny, I, I think this could be a good one for Kevin Lee. Uh, and, and definitely a win he needs right now after uh, losing again to Al- Ally Quinta, man. That was just just a terrible, terrible thing for the trajectory of his career at a yeah. time where he really, uh, with with sort of the 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 chaos surrounding lightweight, uh, what a bad time to drop such a crucial fight because yeah. his name would make a great addition to whatever is going on in the title picture at lightweight right now. Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, let's 
uh, move on from there. I see we we handled all these, so now I yeah, guess we're them, yeah. yeah we're we're at uh, UFC Nashville. Who you got? So Juicy Formiga versus Davison Figueroa. Jason uh, Jason Burgos Figueroa Figueroa yeah. What I say? Figueroa. <laughs> hey, pronunciation is not my thing. Because <laughs> you got an easy name, Walker. It's easy. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a very easy name. It's easy to say, <laughs> Walker. Simple. Um, yeah. All right, so who who are you picking in this one, man? That one was a tough one. I, I mean, for me, is really doing. They're both really on hot streak side. So, Jay, if you can tell me, I, I think they're both like on. Maybe double digit fights, winning streaks, or something like that. Or maybe Figueroa hasn't lost yet. He's undefeated, and Formiga's like won like 20, 17 or some shit like that. But um, it was tough. Formiga seems to be the next guy after Benavides, but Figueroa's right there, right? So I, I went with a little bit of a, the upset pick. I'm going with Figueroa. I th I'm going to go with the younger uh, fighter for the surprise there. Oh, man. I'm. I'm favoring uh, Juicy Formiga uh, in this one because I, I I like to pick the uh, I like to pick the vets a lot of times in some of these cases. Um, so so you look at the guys that Formiga has lost to: Cejudo, Borg, uh, Joseph Benavidez, uh, John Dodson at a different era mm -hmm. um, of of his career, and Ian McCall, who at one point was the best one twenty five er in the world. Um, that's a that's a very elite list. That is a very elite list. Mm -hmm. If um, Davidson can prove himself um, a, a tough challenge for Formiga, it says a lot, a whole lot about his upside. Yeah. But ah, slow and steady went pay, paves the way, man. I, I got um, I got uh, Juice Formiga winning this, um, and I'm not quite sure. If it's going to be a submission or if it's just going to be he shuts down his game, because I know uh, Fig Figueredo is very, very much based on his athleticism. Um, and I think Formiga is one of those guys who can shut that down yeah. by his pure skill. He's definitely not the most gifted of athletes, mm -hmm. but he is very, very skilled. Um, and and I think his his stand up is, is underrated as well. He's very sneaky with some of those punches, man. I, I I think Figueredo might run into a wall and, and not uh, make it out of this one. Hmm. All right. So next, who you got is Curtis Blades versus Justin Willis. Jason, who you got? Blades all day. Nothing against Justin Willis. He's talented. He's uh, curvaceous, which is good too. Uh, but um, it's I just don't see on a stylistic skill level. I just don't see him beating Curtis Blades. Curtis Blades is that guy that he's right up there in the division. He just keeps on hitting that elite ceiling but he's right there he's still relatively young all he's been doing is getting more and more well-rounded i just think he's gonna get to willis take him down just beat him up on the ground i mean maybe uh, you know i'm intrigued to see if willis has a better grappling game that he's been able to show up he's been mainly doing stand-up i mean he outstruck mark hunt very impressive i don't see why curtis blades would at all turn this into a strike fight he's gonna go get close he's gonna take him down bigger stronger skilled I, I just don't see how he's gonna how he's gonna lose this fight. Yeah, man, I think um, I, I think that the Curtis Blades has this fight to win, man. Because um, even if it stays a striking battle, or or not necessarily stays a striking battle, would it would extend its striking exchanges? Curtis Blades ain't bad at that. I yeah, mean, no. looks, yeah, no. yeah, like so um, he's shown him he's shown himself able to handle what Mark Hunt could 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 give him. Uh, Mark Hunt was able to hurt him. He recovered and and went back to what he could do. Um, Overeem landed some good shots on him, but he still did what he did against Overeem. Mm. Um, and and then you look at that. Okay, Ngannou knocked him out, but Ngannou could like could like touch you with your with his pinky, yeah, and, and separate you from your consciousness. He so, could knock out Thor at this point. <laughs> I mean, that's like well, you're talking about the Incredible Hulk, like yeah. the, 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 like he, really? he you're trying to knock out an Avenger. <laughs> so so that's that's when it just kind of gets on the realm of ridiculous. But aside from Curtis Blade, I mean, aside from Francis Ngannou, Curtis Blaze has been money, yeah, all the really? way around. Yep, you know who his, his, his stand up has drastically improved mm -hmm. uh, over the years. I'm trying to remember was it um, who was it? Was it Alexio Olenek that he fought 
and it was like a really boring fight, but it was like he showed he sh- maybe it wasn't Olenek. I don't know that it, it showed everything he needed to show. As I far think it was the as, hunt fight because the hunt fight was a test if he could deal with the striking and then no, he took him down and no, it, it was it was one it wasn't the hunt fight the the hunt fight he he dominated that fight but mm-hmm. it was one where he didn't I'm looking this up right now it was one that he didn't um he, he didn't get a finish and it was it was not a, a, an exciting fight to watch at all but it showed a lot about what yes it was Alex uh, Alexio Linden well mm-hmm. he got it no 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 it was the one before that uh O'Million check that oh, that did that yeah some weird name yeah, yeah yeah so that fight he showed um that he was able to handle standing up uh mm-hmm. throughout the fight now of course that guy isn't isn't the most renowned striker but it showed it, it showed an ability to adjust and just handle things if he couldn't get it down mm-hmm. uh in, in the in the wrestling realm and i think curtis blaze has improved exponentially since um and, and and I think I think it's his fight to lose. I think he dominates Justin Willis. Um, so the final who you got is Wonder Boy Thompson versus Anthony Showtime Pettis. Jason, who you got? This should be Wonder Boy all day. All day. I mean, I make I'm still excited to see it because I'm curious if there is a speed advantage. If Pettis could come in here as a guy who once cut to 145, though that was a bad idea. Fast, lightweight for most of his career. Though he's aging, he's slowed up a bit. If he is faster than Thompson, he's a very good karate striker himself. I, think, I believe that's his, you know, his base background that he came from as a kid. He did karate or something like that, or taekwondo, or something like that. So, I mean, if he has a speed advantage, that could be interesting. If he can cl- close the distance, use speed, and get in here and do some things and use a little boxing, it would be interesting. But I just Thompson is so tough. The only thing I really think Thompson is going to slow him down is just getting older and guys just finally can catch up because his chin isn't granite. He can be got on his chin. But his ability to use the distance, use his length, use his kicks, it's extremely hard to deal with. It, you're, you're, you're stuck trying to find sparring partners for a guy like him. Um, I think Thompson should win. I don't think he can finish him. You know what? I'm going to say he's finishing. I would say third round TKO. He starts piecing him up. He's a bigger man, stronger. You know, Pettis hasn't been hit by a person this side of size with strikes that you don't see. It. So, uh, yeah, I'll say third round TKO. Yeah. I, I favor Wonderboy Thompson to win this. I'm not sure if it, if it's a finish or if it's going to go to decision. And and here's my my reasoning behind this. I think it starts off with Anthony Pettis being very aggressive mm-hmm. uh, and using that speed and trying to close the distance and landing some good shots. However, I don't think it's going to be as easy to close that distance. I think Wonderboy, especially using that lead uh, sidekick, I think he's going to be able to keep him back. Um, and, and and make him think before he comes in. Mm-hmm. And the moment that happens, I, I see Pettis's aggression dropping and him kind of going into a defensive shell. Yeah. And, and even in that defensive shell, though, a Wonder Boy is not the guy to go after you in in full on attack mode. Mm-hmm. Um, take a look at the Johnny Hendricks fight where he it was very clear he was the better fighter very very early on. In, in that bout and and it of course didn't last long but we learned a lot very quickly um in the opening seconds of that and wonder boy d- still did not rush in he still did not rush in and uh, roy uh, mcdonald too? Roy mcdonald as the same thing roy mm-hmm. mcdonald initiated a lot of those exchanges Roy mm-hmm. mcdonald haphazardly would try to close the distance whether he would come in with his chin up or he or he'd try to eminari roll in, in, into wonder boy so I don't think Wonder Boy is going to turn up the aggression. I think he's going to see, oh, I don't really have to do anything but stand here and just pick him apart. Now Pettis has shown himself tough enough to endure hellacious beatings for a very long time. And if you doubt that, watch what um, mm-hmm. rewatch UFC 185 and what Rafael dos Anjos did to him, or the um, Ferguson fight. Yeah, or the Tony Ferguson fight. Yeah, it's another good example. Mm-hmm. So uh, Pettis is as tough as they come, and I think. His toughness might let him live to see the final bell, but I don't think it's going to be pretty. Um, and, and, of course, there is the possibility that we're going to see two um, traditional martial artists have this spectacular battle, kind of like uh, Anderson Silva, Israel Adesanya, where it was like like a, watching a kung fu movie or something. That is a possibility. That's what I'm hoping for. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think it's going to be a, a pretty slow, kind of boring fight. Uh, with Thompson getting his hand raised at the end. All right. Okay, so our final question from Silax one 
Jason, have you ever had the pleasure to serve up your own three piece in a soda? No, I have not had that pleasure. Maybe a one or maybe a two, but never the three piece and the soda. Hmm. Well, I myself have handed out several three pieces oh. with biscuits and sodas and fries oh. and uh, <laughs> an array of side dishes. Um, I, I, I had some rather knucklehead years as as a as a younger man. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So like that's kind of that was kind of part of uh, part of the, the the culture. Like you grow up street fighting. Like mm -hmm. that was, it's kind of, it's kind of basic. Like it, it almost seems they see in the generation now, like, you know, everybody shoots now. They don't, they, they don't fist fight. And when they do fist fight, whoa, it looks terrible. Oh, <laughs> oh it looks awful. Like I tell you, my generation would beat the hell yes. out of, out of these, these world yes. star hip hop kids, man. Yep. Total trash, man. When you see, when you see the stance like this, yes. they put the Oh man, all I'm seeing is ribs. <laughs> Get the barbecue sauce, baby. I've seen ribs. Man, that's oh man, delicious. All right. So, <laughs> so I guess that'll do it for this week uh, for the trenches. Um, maybe next week I'll have some of those production elements working properly. We, we'll never know. We'll never know. But there was um, a period that we were supposed to test some of this. However, uh, an unnamed co-host of the trenches was watching the walking dead instead of answering my text messages to jump on Skype and hangouts to test certain things. But that's another story. So, Who so, we, so it's not, so let's not put blame on anybody because we know captain credentials. Perfect. So, uh, the CEO collector himself, Jason, where can people find you? What do you have coming up for sure? Um, I, right now on the site, I have articles with both, the main the headliners of Belter 218 tomorrow night, which is George Georgie Karahanian and Emmanuel Sanchez. Uh, good fun interviews for both them. Karahanian is good, it's probably a little bit more interesting just because of his controversial and wild finished his ACB run. If you, if you you can look it up in the video if you click the link on and the orange font that's in the one party article, you watch the fight weird end. Um, then they pretty much fired him, and the the, the management of ACB got on him. It, it was a weird situation. And Manny Sanchez is fun too because he really was kind of fairly close to beating uh, Patricio F Pipple for the featherweight title. But he probably went into the fifth round, maybe even in that fight. So just talking about him missing out on the opportunity, bouncing back from it. Also, just interviewed Jason Knight, that former UFC fighter that is going to be main eventing uh, Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship 5 on April 6th. He's fighting Artem Lobov, so I got to talk to him today, so that'll probably be signed in a couple of weeks. And I may be collecting a CEO next week. We'll see. Things happen. Who knows? Um, but other than that, that's what's pretty much going on. As always, on Twitter and Instagram, Cheap Seats Chat. Follow me. Subscribe to my YouTube page. Subscribe to this YouTube page as well, please. Yes, please subscribe to this YouTube page, like this video, mm -hmm. share this video, tell your friends about this video. <laughs> um, so I am Anthony Walker. You can find me on Twitter at Ant Walker MMA. That's also my Instagram name as well. I still don't post a lot, but follow me anyway, just in case I do one day. Um, and aside <laughs> from that, what I have coming up. Uh, so, uh, for SureDog.com, Ask Ant should be live sometime tomorrow or Saturday. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, the questions that we have left over, see what I want to answer, and uh, put that together. So, expect that coming soon. There will be a good, bad, and the ugly post-fight analysis column uh, about UFC Nashville as well. There will also be a post-fight video on my personal YouTube page, The Walkout Network. There will be a walk of shame. For UFC Nashville, an immediate reaction uh, to Wonder Boy versus Anthony Pettis. So I will be uh, in my full glory drinking whiskey and talking <laughs> about fights. And I invite you all to participate and uh, let's have a good time. Uh, so also, um, as, as you know, I'm a contributor for MMA on Point. My latest video for them about uh, 10 post-fight speeches that won over the crowd uh, mm -hmm. is live now. Uh, I think it went live like late last week. So go ahead, check that out as well. I did another appearance on Collider Sports MMA Takedown. So go check that out on their YouTube page and their podcast network as well. <sighs> so with all that said, <sighs> 
It's a, somebody ringing my damn door, I but know. I don't know who that is. <laughs> so, you know what you got to do? You got to stay positive. You got to stay beautiful. And most of all, you got to stay sexy. I will see you when I see you. Peace. Get the